iPhone 14 Pro Max review. Welcome back. This is going to be a quicker one since not a lot has changed on this phone. I feel like I'm saying that a lot more and more. Okay, let's start with Dynamic Island. To be honest, I was skeptical of this at first. It seemed really gimmicky. I'm glad I tried it though because it helps to ease the growing issue smartphones have had for a long time. That problem, of course, is the data bottleneck. Because we use our phones for so many things now, the fact is that this tiny screen, even at its biggest, isn't really enough to communicate everything that it's doing and capable of. That's why Dynamic Island is a good idea. It takes the multifunctionality of the device and makes it more accessible. It actually makes me kind of sad to see Touch Bar going away because I can see that Apple learned lessons from that and is pulling it into this application. For example, when I do a screen recording, I like the way it integrates with Dynamic Island and shows me how long it's been running for. I don't like the way Spotify just stops working sometimes. Occasionally I'll have Spotify pause for a bit and it'll just disappear from Dynamic Island even though it's not needed for any other purpose. It also runs the timer next to any app you already have running on your Dynamic Island, which is quite helpful. But that isn't really what I want to talk about. Next, let's talk about transfers. When transferring from my old iPhone to my new one, I have to reauthorize my passwords with a ton of different services. It would be really nice if Apple would give us a way to essentially clone the phone without all of the extra legwork. On that note, I did the legwork and it's actually not faster or more convenient to restore from a backup on your computer using a wired connection. Which is weird because typically wired connections are, you know, faster. Right now, the transfer process is pretty good, but it could be a lot smoother. Also, if you don't do the transfer exactly right, you have to manually select every app that you want to re-download, and that's time-consuming and monotonous. Of course, I also had to transfer my Apple Watch over, and surprisingly, this took about 30 minutes of concentrated effort, which maybe I'm being unrealistic, but that feels like a lot just to switch my watch from one phone to the next. It kept crashing and fucking <coughs> up, so basically I just had to restart it a couple of times. Uh, I am happy that it retained the settings and complications that I had already set up, given, however, that in Apple's perfect world, everyone's doing this once a year, I'm kind of shocked that, that the friction involved in the overall process, especially given that once I'd finished transferring everything over, there were also issues with focus mirroring and things were generally kind of buggy on these brand new machines. But that isn't really what I want to talk about either. Next, let's talk about the always on display. On the note of design lessons, you can really say how Apple is pulling lessons it's learned from its Apple Watch into this arena. There are several really great aspects to this, and I'm beginning to understand even more why Android users love their widgets so much. I really love the widgets which Apple has enabled on the iPhone, and I can't wait to see this grow. My caveat here is that Apple is trying to do a little too much. The problem with having a screen that actually looks like it's always on is the design implication that I can always interact with it immediately. It's a lot like realizing that a door is a pull, not a push, and as MKBHD implies in his short video, Apple really should have just copied Android's homework on this one. I'll link to his video below the like button. Just in case you don't go and watch his video though, I did want to say that this has actually gotten better. If you're running the latest OS, you can actually toggle your wallpaper off so that you save battery and you're not constantly trying to use your phone when it looks like it's on even though it's not. I've been using these updated settings for a bit now and it's pretty much perfect, but that isn't really what I wanted to talk about either. Next, let's talk about fit and finish. So, when I ordered my 14 Pro Max, I actually accidentally ordered the wrong sized case, which means I've had my wallet attached to the bare back of my phone. All that to say that because of the brushed metal back on this phone, I find the wallet isn't really able to grip it that well, and I didn't think this would really matter because of the magnets, but I'm finding out that it falls off really easily, and because it's a wallet, I don't love that. Oh, also, uh, this is more of a software thing, but I've noticed that it's a little too easy to open the screen switcher on the lock screen. Sometimes I'll just be holding my phone and I'll accidentally open it. Maybe it's just something to get used to, but it feels like it's happening a lot by accident. But that is not really what I wanted to talk about either. Summary. Okay, so as summaries go, I'm not really sure what to say here. It's a nice upgrade, but it's pretty boring. And this, this is what I wanted to talk about. Hey there, this is Editing Ben. I'm about to go on a pretty long and protracted rant about how much I'm sick of the industry. And if you like a good rant, hang in there. If not, go grab a bagel or something. Thanks for watching and don't forget to smash that subscribe button. Okay, back to the rant. I have yet to see another meteoric or interesting leap in the smartphone world. You know how the M1 chips just blew us away with their performance? I want to feel excitement like that again, because the really big problem that Apple apparently doesn't know it has is that it's becoming the Facebook of phones, in that there are problems, but overall the thing does what it's supposed to do for the most part, and it works pretty well. Quarterly earnings are up, so why change something that isn't broken? But it's not the bleeding edge. The closest thing I can think of here is a folding phone, which kind of demonstrates how desperate we are for something new. In my opinion, the truth here is that if Apple and Google don't create a new, better interface, someone else will. And 
those names will be as forgotten as MySpace. I firmly believe that this will take the form of augmented reality, but Apple has been the establishment for so long that it seems like they're afraid to make a mistake, which I see Google doing some somewhat interesting things with live translation, but truthfully, what I want is something more akin to Facebook's MetaQuest Pro, which I will be reviewing in the very near future. Ultimately, while I know I need a phone, I've been waiting for someone with deep pockets who isn't Facebook to develop this since I was a little kid, and I'm so tired of reviewing boring stuff. So I'm going to stop reviewing iPhones until they make something worth talking about, uh, except for the AirPods Pro, because I do want to try those. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk and for putting up with my little rant. That's pretty much it for now. I'm BRB. This is BRBTG. And as always, I'll be right back.